Welcome back, guys. In this final chapter of our pulmonary rehab lecture, we're going to talk about respiratory muscle performance, clinical examination, and treatment. So we'll go over how do we assess the respiratory muscles, and then how do we treat the respiratory muscles if we identify impairments in performance. For those wondering why I have these two pictures here, I think they're kind of fitting, almost quite apt, for this unit. Um, on the right, we have Bush, which is one of my favorite bands growing up as a kid. Of course, we have the classic song, Machine Head, which has the refrain, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And on the left, you might not be familiar, um, is the band The Prodigy, who had the classic song, Breathe, which has the lines uh, in their refrain, breathe the pressure, come on, play a game, I'll test you, which is kind of exactly what we'll be doing with respiratory muscle assessment, breathing in the pressure, in and out, and testing it. So, um, probably the most common unit that you'll see when we're assessing respiratory muscle performance are assessments of peak respiratory muscle strength. And again, we use this we use the term respiratory muscles, inspiratory muscles, ventilatory muscles interchangeably. Not the biggest fan of respiratory muscles because like, yeah, they do more ventilation. They don't really do respira respiration, but that's the term that's used there. So you may see respiratory muscles, inspiratory muscles, breathing muscles, all those. We're, we're talking about, you know, the diaphragm and the intercostal and all those muscles, right? So um, the two biggest ones we'll see are maximum inspiratory pressure and maximal expiratory pressure. And they're exactly what you think they are. So this involves for MIP, which is probably the biggest, um, most commonly used assessment. We have patients fully expire, so they completely empty their lungs to residual volume. And then they perform a maximum <sighs> breath in for as long or for ideally as long as they can, but at least they get to a peak effort within the first second. Um, some say one and a half seconds, maybe depending on the protocol, but that's, it's the peak value obtained at the first second, right? So they breathe all the way out and then breathe in, full breath in. And we're assessing that peak negative pressure, remembering that the, we're, we're producing negative pressure to draw air into the lungs, a way for us to look at what's the peak capacity of our breathing muscles, right? Um, and then we're looking at maximum expiratory pressure or MEP, which is basically the opposite maneuver. So the patient will fully inhale to total lung capacity. So their lungs are fully, you know, inflated and full with air, and then they'll breathe out as forcefully as they can. And we'll look at the positive pressure of air being forced out of the lungs in the airway. So it's the opposite. And I'm sorry if that was really loud, right? So um, both measures measure the peak pressure after the first second of effort. An acceptable maneuver, the device will calculate it themselves, is that uh, a plateau after the first two seconds of maneuvers. These are short maneuvers. They don't last you for long. We're looking at peaks. Now, we typically do three trials, um, and we are hoping that the, um, the values are within 10% of each other. So if I test someone and their first value was 100 centimeters of water, which is the unit that we use, CM, let me draw that out, centimeters of water is the unit we use. If say they do a test and it's 100 centimeters of water and then the second test they do is 80 centimeters of water, right? That those are you know too far apart for this to be a reliable assessment. We wanna make sure that we're giving at least a minute between each set um, or each trial just because we don't want to factor in fatigue. We don't want to fatigue the muscles. And we also want people to hyperventilate and pass out. Uh, the maximum number you should ever do for testing is nine. Um, and actually, we find performance suffers typically after the eighth rep, right? So you really want to make sure that you're coaching patients correctly because it's an effort-driven test. It's going to be heavily dependent on that, that peak or inspiratory flow rate because um, how these devices work is we measure the pressure differentials across a uh, pressure transducer. Um, if a flow rate is not maximal, um, we're not going to get a true value of pressure. So it's really got to encourage people. You really got to breathe in as deep and as forcefully as you possibly can at, at the initial breath in. It's not a gradual build up. It's not a, it's a maximal breath in.
Now, there are some methodological considerations, right? So positioning, the patient should be seated in a chair when they're performing this, their back should be supported, and they should be in this 90-90-90 position where their hips are at 90 degrees, their ankles are at 90 degrees, and their knees are at 90 degrees. So that's what happens when they sit in the chair. They can start leaned over a little bit if they, if they want to, and then kind of come up into upright and sitting as they perform the test. Um, their nose should be clipped, so we create a hermetic seal. So all the pressure that we're creating from this maneuver is only being captured um, through the, the mouthpiece here or here, okay? And we really wanna try to limit them from using their cheeks, right? Because that's gonna affect the pressure uh, recording. So we'll get some pressure um, from the cheeks kind of sucking in. We don't want that. We wanna look at what's happening in those respiratory muscles. Now, again, this doesn't just look at the diaphragm, right? This is looking at all of the respiratory muscles. So some people say, well, I can't really assess diaphragm weakness um, using these maneuvers. Well, I'm like, well, what, what, you know, what muscle constitutes 80% of breathing is, is the diaphragm. Um, and realistically, functionally, they're gonna use all those muscles anyway, right? So we can't escape you know, accessory muscles, we can't escape intercostals, they're gonna be involved. So I, it's, a, it's a valid test, don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Now, um, now, other things to consider, again, making sure people have a good seal, there's different mouthpieces here, are two pretty common devices, um, the micro RPM, which does uh, met, uh, measurements as well. Um, and then the Power Breathe KH2, these are uh, units that I use in my research and clinical practice, um, both excellent devices. Um, and the other big thing is the lung volume at the starting point. Like I mentioned, it's an effort-driven test, but it also kind of depends on where you start. So if you start only at FRC, which is at you know the end of a quiet expiration, so quiet breathing, that air that remains in the lungs, and you don't fully go with residual volume, that can affect the airway resistance. Remember, if you've got more air in your lungs, um, again, not, not, not in an abnormal sense, like in COPD, but if you've got, you know, you go back to, you know, your just regular resting state where those force of the chest and the lungs are in balance, which is FRC, there's gonna be more air in your lungs than there would be at residual volume where you've emptied most of the air in your lungs. You only have that maybe liter or so that's in there. That's gonna narrow or make the airways a little bit smaller, which may affect the resistance and the, you know, so you may produce a little bit different pressure. So it's really important that um, if you're testing patients, you're giving them the same instructions um, for every every person you assess, um, and especially if, you know, for every trial within each individual. So, you know, bear that in mind, depending on where you start, whether it's an FRC or residual volume, will affect the pressure you can generate during this maneuver. Um, we also find that, you know, um, We'll look at some predictive equations that the maximum respiratory pressure is obviously, you know, um, affected by your age, your gender, your height, or gender sex, um, what weight, your fitness level, and your smoking status. These are all things that can uh, impact. So, um, you know, these are all different things to consider. And um, again, it's really important that people know what they're doing so that you get, um, you know, good tests. I usually give people at least one familiarization rep um, and I'm probably gonna probably do around maybe four in, in the first time I do with the patient. Just, it does take a little bit of doing to really make sure that first breath in is um, uh, as full and as forceful as possible. Um, so the advantage of this is that, you know, it gives you some really great and reliable data. This has been around for years. Uh, but, you know, the one limitation is we don't typically breathe at peak pressures. So there are some limits to like, what is this actually assessing? Is this assessing how the muscles are actually working um, in most instances. Um, now, if, say if you're working in a patient who maybe has a spinal cord or a stroke or Bell's palsy or a traumatic brain injury or maybe some kind of oral facial issue and they can't get the mouthpiece in, you can perform what we call a sniff nasal pressure and it's exactly as you think it is, right? So instead of taking a mouthpiece, you have a little tube um, and a little like plug at the end. And uh, what the patient does is uh, they place that tube in and they breathe in through their nose. So we measure the peak pressures in the occluded nostril with this little plug, which has a pressure transducer. Um, and we breathe in through the unopposed nose. So it's a way for us, like someone who's got you know, facial um, or just maybe motor coordination issues in their nose, or maybe really young kids that maybe don't have the right mouth mouthpiece, um, we can use a sniff pressure to look at um, respiratory muscle performance. So um, it's another static 
instatory pressure maneuver. Um, and uh, again, this is great for people who just can't fit in their, uh, can't fit a mouthpiece in, or they just can't get the technique down. You can do a sniff pressure. And there are reference values for this as well. Now the normal, uh, and, and both in adults and in kids. So again, if you, if you can't get a kid to figure out the technique, a sniff pressure might not be a bad option potentially. Um, now the normal MIP for, for patients, and this is using mouth pressure. So using, you know, um, that typical, you know, MIP maneuver where you're breathing in through your mouth. Um, as you can see, it does decrease as we age, right? So younger people typically have better, um, pressure generation abilities. Um, women typically be, are a little bit lower than men, right? Um, and this is generally a good thing that we've got, you know, pretty high capacity. I mean, if you look at what, you know, the static compliance of the lungs, we're only really probably need to be expending five to 10, maybe 10 at most centimeters of water to, ex, you know, expand our lungs and breathing 500 milliliters of air into our, into our lungs. Don't need to do much. Um, and for most people, that's like five to 10% of your peak. Like you're working sub threshold, which is ideal. We would never probably want to be working or breathing when we're, you know, it's costing us 80% of our max or 90% of our max. Now there are some patients where this happens, um, like patients with COPD, patients with IPF, obesity, um, where those muscles are so much weaker, they can, can't produce that much pressure. So even just normal breathing for them can be a bit of a challenge. And again, dyspnea really is an imbalance between the force generating um, properties of your breathing muscles, like how much pressure you can, negative pressure you can generate to the demands of breathing, right? It's a force imbalance. If you've got a high capacity, you might not get as dyspneic when demands increase, right? Something to consider. Now, how do we define weakness, right? So people who fall out of the normal range, like that's not weakness, it's just they're below normal. We classify weakness as anyone um, under 40 who can breathe in uh, less than uh, 63 centimeters of water, okay? This comes from the European Respiratory and ATS updated guidelines. Um, and obviously this changes kind of as we age, as lung compliance change. Remember our lungs become more compliant, become more easily stretched um, at, a, at, a, at a same pressure um, in someone who's older, right? Because we lose elastin. So again, weakness is really at this point. And this is really more due to the fact that, um, again, we get closer and closer, you know, to um, our max, right? Um, you know, if we're, you know, typically a tidal breath is about 10 centimeters of water. If we get, um, you know, if we're at 63, and that's 10, that's at six, we're working at 16% potentially of our water at max just to, just to breathe normally. The other big concern is to really fully inflate the lung. We're looking at 40 to maybe 45 centimeters of water to really recruit the lung. Um, and you know, again, if we're in a healthy person, right? Even if you're, um, you know, old elderly, like that's not really, you know, maybe at, at most 50% of max to fully inflate your lung. Um, you know, if you are at, you know, 40 or 63 centimeters of water and you're trying to recruit your lung, which is cost 40, right? You're gonna have some problems clearing and maybe producing cough, uh, producing cough, so you just can't open the lungs as much and produce enough um, you know, volume to breathe pressure to expectorate. So, <coughs> so again, um, no pun intended there with that cough. Um, these are our values for weakness. Now, um, there are some prediction equations you could put in there as well to factor in different units, we, as we know, that is, uh, uh, maybe more, you know, you know, these, these, these factors that influence uh, respiratory muscle performance, but an easy way to kind of just, you know, if you have just age and, and sex, these are great age and sex matched norms. We have lower limits of normal, but if you want to get maybe more specific and seeing, you know, where they fall in terms of predicted norms, that's a way for you to, uh, to kind of, um, calculate that there. Now, like I mentioned, uh, we don't really breathe at our max, like to fully recruit, expand the lungs, it takes like 40 centimeters of water, 55 maybe in a diseased lung. Like we don't ever really get to a point where we're really taxing ourselves. Our, our respiratory muscles are primarily doing endurance-based activity. They breathe, you know, from the very first breath we take to the last breath we take, like it's endurance-based activity. Um, and again, for a normal breath, we're looking at maybe five, 10 at most centimeters of water to bring in a normal tidal volume. Um, so maybe we want to look at endurance. So there's, these are some different tests that we can use for endurance. Probably the, the easiest one is a constant load 
uh, protocol where we set the load at a percentage of the MIP. So typically about 50% of someone's MIP. So we measure their MIP and then we have them breathe against that um, to failure, right? To see how long it takes for them to get to failure. Typically this test um, should end within about eight to 12 minutes for most people. Um, we set the pace to a metronome and then we record um, the results in total time or total work, which would be pressure times um, times time, or multiply by time. Um, so this is great because again, it's a way for us to look at probably at how the muscles are really operating. They're, again, we're assessing endurance. So again, we, we, we wanna assess you know for these muscles by how they typically operate, right? If they're more an endurance muscle, probably wanna assess their ability to, you know, to produce force you know, at a low th sub-threshold over time. So this is a constant load or fixed load uh, protocol where the load is set consistently based on a percentage of the MIP, usually 50% is what we use. Um, we brief to a patient fails, which is um, when they either they say they're done or if they you know, um, get to the predicted time, say we say, all right, we want you to do this for 12 minutes. They get to 12 minutes, all right, that's done. Um, or if they you know, produce three, nine, three consecutive breaths where they have a failed rep, which is uh, this little plunger, um, which has this valve attached to it, like it doesn't open, and that's a failed breath, right? Um, so uh, that's kind of how that test works. And we set the resistance by uh, winding up this coil to that valve. So every time they breathe in, if they breathe enough pressure, this valve moves down and air is able to flow into the lungs, okay? So that's how that basically works, okay? Um, you always need to be careful too of patients, like you don't want them to hyperventilate. So sometimes patients, um, we typically keep the cadence at around um, 20 or so breaths per minute just so that people aren't hyperventilating. Uh, sometimes they may also be given like a, a plug-in for CO2 so we keep their carbon dioxide consistent. We don't want people hyperventilating, washing out all their CO2 and passing out. Um, the other one you might see is a maximum incremental threshold. So basically people uh, breathe against usually a resistive load, which is where they we use a tapered flow. So instead of the pressure threshold, which is hooked up to a coil, we basically give them smaller and smaller um, holes to breathe through. Um, the advantage is we can kind of work them up to task failure a little bit easier um, because we can, we can keep adding more and more load. Uh, the problem with that is that humans are almost like incapable of utilizing um, a, uh, you know, or maintaining breath to breath flow rates. Uh, so the resistance is gonna be a little bit inconsistent. Um, the other would be a time trials, just you know, having them breathe as fast as they possibly can, um, or a hypernia test, again, keeping them in set ventilation and then breathing to failure and often done at eucapnia. So we give them a little bit of maybe rebreathing to keep that carbon dioxide consistent. And here are some prediction equations that you can utilize for inspiratory muscle um, endurance. So looking at constant load, and incremental load, um, and then factoring um, age and years, and then sex, we have our constants there. For males, it's one. For females, it would be zero. Um, and you just compare, again, how they fall along those lines. Now, um, an emerging test um, is a, these assessments of single breath work capacity. And I like this because um, it's a little bit of both, a little bit of both of uh, strength and endurance. And this old adage, like find your, find your someone who can do both, right? So I like this test and I use this often in my clinical practice, a test of incremental respir respiratory endurance for subjects perform a maximal and sustained maximal inspiratory effort. Uh, so they breathe all the way out to residual volume and they breathe all the way in for as deep and forcibly as they possibly can for as long as they can. So um, this measure will give you the MIP because they're still doing a maximal maneuver and will also um, give you a marker of endurance. How long can they sustain peak pressure output? Um, what is the total work capacity? So we'll plot um, using the software, we'll plot the pressure they, that they are producing you know, throughout the entire maneuver plotted over time so we can get a, a unit of power, right? Um, so we can get an endurance assessment, we can get a strength assessment, we can get a work capacity assessment. And then we can look at different characteristics of the curve that is produced as we plot pressure over time. We can look at the slope of the curve and other uh, unique characteristics. This is almost analogous to the 30 second Wingate test, which looks at peak aerobic capacity or peak um, anaerobic power 
um, which looks at you know your peak power output and how long you're able to maintain that cadence as you cycle um, at that at that power output. It's the same kind of concept here. We're looking at fatigability. Uh, a lot of this work came from uh, Larry Cahalan's group, um, Ken Chatham, um, uh, Ross Serena, myself. We're doing some of the stuff here in Chicago and obesity. Uh, and Magno Formiga, uh, who's now down in Brazil, who just who's been publishing a lot of the stuff recently, looking into COPD. It's a fantastic test. Big fan of it. Um, pretty simple to do. It's the same exact setup. Um, three to five trials, a minute in between each trial. And again, the big difference between this test is the patient breathes all the way out first, just like you did with a regular MIT maneuver. They breathe in as forcefully and fully as they possibly can, and they go for as long as they can. So that's the only thing that changes. So they go from breathing all the way out to breathing all the way in. for as long as it can. And we have a video demonstrating this technique um, in, in the, the supplemental videos. So the advantage of this, again, is I can get both the MIPS, so I can get the, the peak pressure within that first second or so, or first second and a half average, but then as we, they keep breathing in, I can look at the pressure produced over a period of time. So this is all pressure here on the y-axis, pressure, and this is time. So I can see how, well, how long are they able to keep continuing pressure. So I get a measurement of endurance. I get a measurement of peak strength, right? So I get you know time here, right? So inspiratory duration would be here. And then I get, again, the total area under the curve, right? Looking at power, which is kind of factoring in both strength and endurance. And then I can look at the characteristics, right? Like, do they fatigue really quickly? Do Are they able to kind of, you know, have this more gradual slope? Or is there a you know, a, you know, a quick peak and plateau and then fall off. Like we can look at different unique characteristics, right? Which I think is nice because what I'm finding in patients with, with um, obesity is they often have a, um, an issue, um, you know, or, you know, where we, they may have a higher MIP maneuver, but if I plot them over time, they're actually, their performance is a little bit worse um, than someone um, who has um, even a lower MIP. So there's an individual here, right? So they got up to a MIP of 99, right? So pretty good peak pressure. Um, but if I plot them over time, they get to fatigue within seven seconds, right? Their total power is 346. Whereas this individual, right? They have a lower MIP, but they're able, right? They're, they're, their technique could have been a little, a little bit better, but they have a much longer duration, 12 seconds. And thus their power producing or power capacity is almost twice of what we see in the individual who, despite having a higher MIP. So we theorize potentially that well, maybe things were just kind of went underlying. We missed a lot of patients um, with weakness because we think respiratory muscle weakness defined by MIP is pretty rare. But again, we may be potentially missing other characteristics of respiratory muscle performance because we're only assessing peak pressures, right? Um, this is a way for us to look at pressure as well as endurance, as well as, this, again, overall work capacity. How much work can these muscles do? Um, and then look at fatigability characteristics. So I'm a big fan of this test because uh, it gives us the standard measure of MIP, uh, but it also gives us all those different characteristics of muscle performance, right? We don't ever just want to have one uh, data plot, plot. We want to have a, a you know, wider resolution, more, more data points, right, to an assessment, the more robust and probably the more accurate the assessment is. Um, so, um, in uh, after we make our assessments, we will, um, you know, if a patient has weakness, we may prescribe them inspiratory muscle training. So inspiratory muscle training um, is great because again, we can improve you know, endurance, exercise capacity. We find it's probably more useful for patients um, who are deconditioned, who have um, demonstrated inspiratory muscle weakness. If you are physically active and can work at higher capacities, you're gonna be working out your breathing muscles a bit too, right? So, um, you know, do you need to do it maybe for an athletic population? Maybe marginal gains. Um, do we need to do this for a healthy population? Maybe not. But for people with weakness, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty pretty powerful tool. And the great thing is they can do it kind of anywhere. So one of the more common devices we see is a threshold device. Um, again, it operates by having this coiled, um, uh, our valve attached to these coils. So basically we can wind up the coil to make it, you know, the resistance a little bit higher. So every uh, breath we breathe in, 
right? Uh, we have to generate enough pressure set by this coil to allow air to flow into the device, right? So we can you know, increase it or decrease it by winding up this coil. And there's usually a little um, end here and then they breathe in um, through here, All right? So coils wind up to a plunger, set threshold. And this is great because unlike resistive devices, which just narrow uh, the tube we breathe in, uh, those are dependent on flow rate. A threshold trainer um, uses threshold. So it doesn't matter how your flow rate is, this is going to be 30 centimeters of water that is needed to be open or however we set it. So it's, it's independent or a flow independent resistance, which is nice because we can be very specific with how we are training um, our patients, which is always ideal. Now, how does IMT or RMT work? And it's a classic image from Jerry Dempsey. Like we had mentioned, you know, um, in patients with, especially patients with respiratory muscle issues like heart failure or COPD, we see greater um, activity, greater blood flow go into this breathing muscle because we're overactive for a lot of different reasons. Um, if we get them up to a point where they're exercising, we may evoke this respiratory muscle metabolic reflex where we get fatigue and contractions of the diaphragm. We see produce more met uh, metabolites, right? Because they start moving into almost an, oct or an anaerobic uh, metabolism, which stimulates those um, uh, group three and group four um, afferents, which you know, travel through the phrenic nerve, which is a mixed nerve, which is sent to um, our brain, and we cause it causes a um, sym uh, sympathetic discharge, which constricts peripheral uh, blood vessels, and that therefore redistributing um, or uh, shifting or shunting blood, basically the respiratory muscles. So basically what happens is if the respiratory muscles become fatigued, right? Um, they start producing more metabolites, especially aerobic, uh, anaerobic metabolites, which stimulate our afferents, um, those metaboreceptors in the phrenic nerve, which sends up to um, the sympathetic nervous system, which causes a vasoconstriction to steal blood away from uh, the peripheral muscles, like the leg muscles, and to shunt it to the breathing muscles uh, to keep them, you know, nourished, to keep them perfused, you know, to meet demand. Uh, which, if that happens, well, if we're exercising, we still need blood flow to our legs. We can lead to leg muscle fatigue um, and this higher effort perception because we're stealing blood away from the legs to spare uh, the breathing muscles. Again, our body is always going to prefer breathing over anything else. Um, so our thought is if we can improve the strength of the respiratory muscles and their you know, ability to produce force um, or their endurance, we might be able then to uh, stave off this respiratory muscle metabolic reflex. And in fact, in a heart failure model, this has been shown to occur. Um, there's a class study that's published in 2008. I can't remember, that. I think Grinnell is the author um, in Jack, 2008, where they, they looked at lug, lead leg blood flow during exercise and in fact it improved um, training. So this is this is something that works. Like we know this principle exists. Um, whether it's not, it, do we make the muscles more um, efficient or do we just make those nerves less sensitive to metabolites because we're training them, right? So there's a couple of theories out there, but the respiratory muscle metabolic reflexes um, and affecting that is how we think we improve exercise capacity. Now we published um, a paper back in 2017 that looked at uh, maybe there's improvements in airway mechanics because uh, there's a, a rat model that looked at a heart failure that found uh, respiratory muscle training improves Newtonian uh, resistance in the airways. So possibly respiratory muscles have effects beyond just improving the muscle. Uh, respiratory muscle training has effects beyond just improving the muscles um, you know, ability to generate force and fatigue and all that stuff. But um, you know, there is uh, maybe some evidence in, in animal models that may improve um, airway characteristics too, which is a very novel finding. We always thought it was just the muscle. So endurance protocols typically, again, um, we're gonna be a lower, just like for any muscle, we're gonna be training at a lower um, resistance. Um, goal, 30 minutes a day, broken up at least six hours apart. And then a strength-based protocol, typically 50 to 60% of MIPS, 25 to 35 breaths per session, also six hours apart. Again, you don't want to ever do these sessions like right after um, you, you know, or right after each other. You want to give your breathing muscles time to recover because if you work them out too hard, it can have problems breathing. So uh, six hours apart. Um, typically, we, tr we try to train to the pretty good fatigue, um, you know, 
and that should occur within two to three minutes, roughly five minutes maybe per session. Um, monitoring then if they get dizzy or lightheaded or anything like that, then adjusting the training load um, every maybe, you know, every couple of weeks by about 10%. And we do that after by retesting to see did their MIP improve. Um, so it's super easy to use. It's great for patients, um, again, starting out maybe um, because they can do this at home. Um, we think maybe in patients with really severe disease, it's a nice primer for exercise because uh, they can do this without having, um, you know, they can do it sitting. They don't, you know, we, so we can kind of build up the strength of those muscles, the breathing muscles, and then maybe eventually wean them on to con conventional exercise like treadmill walking or a new step or something else. So if you've got someone who's really struggling with exercise, um, might not be a bad idea to consider doing some IMT with them. Um, there's also isokinetic types of training. So using that same uh, tire device, we can use a software that allows us to plot, um, you know, pressure over time during a training session. So we can kind of have them train basically um, at a set um, pressure over a period of time. So it's almost like isokinetics. We're keeping the same force over, over time. So uh, we think this may be effective because they basically will have a higher time under tension. Um, but this is kind of almost a, too, a little bit deep in the weeds here. For most patients, your conventional endurance-based protocols or strength-based protocols are probably just fine. Um, there's evidence for using this in patients with um, that VIDD, so patients in the ICU. Um, so we can either give them a you know, resistive device, so by you know, placing a resistance on a passive muir valve, um, or just using the passive muir valve itself, um, using threshold devices. So there's an image here from, uh, from, from one of these publications here. I think it's Danny Martin's paper, um, where they're applying it right to the trach. So we can apply that threshold trainer um, right to the trach, right? So we can get that spring-loaded, you know, set pressure for these patients. So, um, you know, and again, why that's advantage is patients weaning from a, um, a vent, their breathing pattern might be a little bit a little funky. So this is nice because the, the, the pressure is not going to be influenced again by the flow rate. So if you want to be very specific, these threshold trainers are great. There are other devices out there. Power Breathe has devices um, that are also have a very set pressure, but uh, you know, these, are, these are very effective. These are you know, pretty affordable too. Um, so again, some recommendations from um, you know, some evidence is out there now looking at um, you know, VIDD and ICU work. Um, so like different different protocols that we can utilize. And then respiratory muscle training and obesity, um, tons of evidence out there now, more and more coming, we're publishing more stuff, finding that this can improve uh, dyspnea, um, exercise capacity in patients with obesity. Um, and the thought process is, again, similar to patients um, with lung disease, like COPD or ILD, is that this can be done in very short intervals. Like if you know we're looking at three breaths twice per day, they can do it seated, right? They don't have to go anywhere. We give them the device, um, and you know it, it's it's very effective for improving dyspnea. And we know that's a big problem in patients with obesity. So um, we think it may even be a couple, again this primer for conventional training. Like start them out on a respiratory muscle training program. Maybe give them as a home exercise program, and we use that as we try to wean up. Um, or titrate up their intensity of conventional training. Um, we find it effective after bariatric surgery for improving the recovery of lung volume potentially, um, as well as attenuating some of the re acute reductions of respiratory muscle strength that we see actually um, after a, a major you know, abdominal surgery. Um, and we actually see it might even improve oxygenization in patients, so helping with recovery. Now, kind of almost down into the, into the weeds here, so like we mentioned, you know, there may be a role here at the diaphragm and respiratory muscles in patients with uh, low back pain. So when we mentioned the patients with COPD have that change potentially in their, that, that um, multi-segmental control, they lose that anticipatory possible adjustment because they have um, this change, basically they, they lose the, the ability to do both ventilation and uh, motor control. We think this may be involved in some patients with low back pain because um, we see almost the same sort of rigid writing responses that are ankle heavy in patients with low back pain. This is a lot of work by Lottie Janssen's as well. And we found that patients with non-specific low back pain, um, after doing an eight week protocol of IMT at 60% of their PI max, um, they improved 
um, their back pain improved. Now, whether or not this is just natural history, um, but we, the improvements in respiratory muscle strength were occurring simultaneously with improvements in back pain and severity, so as well as motor control. So we think maybe this is involved in some patients. Is this a go-to assessment? No, but if it's something, a patient's struggling, um, you know, maybe you want to assess respiratory muscles, and if they are weak, maybe you want to intervene with some training. So here is an image that we used in um, our publication. It's a textbook chapter, uh, just some great general guidelines um, for how to prescribe uh, strength-based protocols, low and base protocols, and then just the role of you know, high threshold. So like working at your ventilatory threshold during an aerobic, like cycling or, 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 or running. Um, again, you know, if you're really active, we typically see respiratory muscle preserved. So uh, that's all I have for respiratory muscle assessment. Uh, again, I know this was a little bit of material. We went a little bit longer than a typical lecture, but I hope you guys found this useful. Um, again, I'm a big fan of this. It's what I assess yearly in all my obese patients. Um, and I think, uh, you know, again, absolutely has a role in pulmonary rehabilitation. So thank you guys for tuning in.